All right, everyone. Hello and welcome. Uh, it's just a couple of minutes after 12 noon East Coast. Good afternoon for East Coast people. Otherwise, hi and welcome to everyone else. My name is Ori Shibi. I'm going to talk in the next close to an hour about the voice of the customer. Um, quick introduction. I will do the short version because we have only an hour. Uh, this is me. Um, I work with Procept uh, Associates and uh, I'm the business analysis practice lead. They do project management, agile business analysis and a whole bunch of things in between. I uh, have written uh, 2.9 books. It means that uh, two books have already been published in the last couple of years. And then uh, the next one uh, is going to be published in, uh, that's the point nine. Um, at the end of the summer, in September, this is Agile Business Analysis, co-authored with Kevin Aguano um, and CEO of Procept. Otherwise, I have been doing all sorts of projects related to Agile Business Analysis, project management with all sorts of organizations. One of the things that probably most organizations have in common is that when you come in, you see that stuff is not exactly as ideal as it may look from the outside. Uh, I don't know if it's encouraging for some or not, but uh, sometimes it's disturbing. So let's move ahead to our topic, voice of the customer. Um, there's a whole bunch of list of objectives here that are taken from the newly designed course that we are going to introduce in the, to introduce in the fall, a course titled Voice of the Customer, uh, based on the book cover that is on the title page of this webinar. Right? It's a very visual and very, um, effective book that really simplifies the process of doing so. Uh, why are we doing it? Why voice of the customer? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we view uh, and many others view voice of the customer as an extension of business analysis. Um, why? Because we need to do requirements. We need to understand customers' needs. Uh, a lot of the tools and a lot of the techniques that, that uh, have to be utilized here uh, are demonstrated by business analysts um, in organizations, in enterprises, and in projects. Uh, the flow of what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to go by the flow of that book, right? We're going to do a little bit of introduction in context and then understanding what customers want, interpret, innovate, and then utilize the critical tools. And we're going to go through those, that 4i process that is on the right side of the screen. So first of all, let's take a look at some context. Um, in recent years, there's been a shift in the way customers and brands, that is customers and organizations, they interact, right? In the past, the brands, the companies used to have a lot more power. And um, in a way, this power has been shifting. Uh, customers are more empowered these days to do their research, to know what's going on and to make more choices. And of course, we have an accelerated channel through social media to express anything that we like or that we don't like, uh, almost in real time. Um, therefore, there is a growing need to translate the needs of the customer to products and features by organizations. And we can still see organizations that, it's not that they don't make an effort, but their effort does not translate to alignment between what they offer and what we as customers need, right? So companies must stay current with their offerings and must not only constantly offer um, the, the actual, the current needs for the customers, in the form of products and features, but also keep up with the competition that is not staying behind. At the same time, because of social media and whatnot, customers are very unforgiving. And more and more, we're starting to realize, okay, we have projects and we have efficiencies and we have products and we have a whole bunch of things, but we got to go further up or earlier in the food chain to further understand the true needs of customers and then translates those need translate those needs into products and features. Gartner since 2014 has uh, repeatedly identified in all sorts of uh, pieces of research a uh, voice of the customer as a top strategy in providing customer experience, good customer experience. Um, so what is the voice of the customer? Right, we are looking here at um, 
a way to describe customers' needs, right? And describe the feedback that customers provide about their experience. Um, essentially like experience management, if you like. Voice of the customer focuses on the customer's needs and the expectations and the understanding, and then on developing and improving our products. It allows us to systematically engage, gain insights, and then translate those insights into uh, things that we do, products, features, and of course, the way we do things. And as I said before, it can be viewed as a subset of business analysis because we are fur moving further earlier in the food chain in order to make sure that before we even put, develop a product, we understand that this is the right product for the customer. When we are looking, oh, slides, okay, sorry. When we are looking at voice of the customer, um, it's important to put it in context with business analysis and requirements and project management and all these other things that um, many organizations heavily focus on. So the traditional focus of organizations is, if we can say it within the project, but it is a little, a little bit limited because it does not take into consideration uh, opportunity analysis um, or even the business case when we focus only on the project. One of the, uh, it's not a, ma a matter of flaw, it's a matter of boundary. And uh, the Project Management Institute identified the scope of the project uh, to start when we charter the project. Therefore, things like opportunity analysis and business case being outside of the project are not necessarily the focus of the project manager. And therefore, many project managers are not going to be involved in this process. Now, the discipline of business analysis is going a little bit further and expands to cover these areas, but still, they may not be sufficient. There is a need to better understand the customer, and we established that it's going beyond the project, and it's even going beyond the life cycle approach. And uh, having had a few conversations with colleagues and also noticing that um, in the context of Agile, yes, Agile improves processes and improves our ability to respond, makes us more nimble. And again, it's customer centric. We can address changes more effectively. It's about reducing risk of building the wrong thing and making mistakes. But at the same time, we can argue that the Agile with all its benefits may be too confined to customer needs because we don't ask really the customer beyond what they identify as their needs. It's almost like we are thinking inside the box of the customer. So we engage the customer and we check what they want and what they need and uh, they answer to us, but we are not looking at a more holistic view to check if what the customer wants and needs and articulates is really the right thing to do. So that's why it's more foundational and it precedes those steps related to business analysis, traditional project management. In a way, we can take a look and say, okay, here's a little bit of a simplified flow. We have opportunity analysis and we do some business case and feasibility analysis. If it's a goal, it leads to requirements. And then, of course, we have the project and one form of life cycle could be agile in order to stay more nimble and more tuned. But then where does the voice of the customer fit? It fits before voice of the customer sets the tone and actually helps us understand whether this product is the right product or it should be a different product or something else altogether. Uh, so before we are going in and see how we proceed with that area of focus of voice of the customer, I'll just uh, remind you, if you have any questions, please type them in and I will leave time at the end to address questions um, as they come up. If there's something more urgent, I will try to keep an eye on um, if you want to show hands, and then um, it's going to be easier for me even to address questions in real time. You're all muted, so um, please type them in in any case. So moving ahead, who performs customer voice of the customer research? Right, because uh, it's not a matter of a new role, it's a matter of somebody has to do it. And uh, like we said, business analysts, or at least the skill of business analysis comes to mind when we are trying to explore and understand and articulate the customer need. 
uh, generally, who needs to do it? Anyone who wants to become an industry leader, one way or another, we need to understand our customers. Examples of benefits, right, that can be identified and infl implemented through voice of the customer uh, programs, identify and prioritize the customer's needs. And then, as a result of that, customize the products and the services and what we do to meet those needs. Uh, it's also going to allow us to prioritize and pick our battles. And when we look at issues and opportunities, allow us to engage and solicit and evaluate for new ideas. And the bottom line, increase the profit and the value that we create by improving processes. Right? And by the way, when I say improving processes, doing it while maintaining alignment with customer needs. Um, unfortunately, many organizations fail in that department and we can see it by their service offerings or customer service or processes. And we can see how sometimes grossly misaligned those processes are for what the customer actually needs. Even a simple example that we can uh, uh, give all our telecom providers wherever we are, when you dial in and you have two things to inquire about, one of them may be a building inquiry and another one is a technical support, the way that the, customer, the, way that the service provider is structured is siloed, therefore we will have to wait in two separate queues. So I'm gonna pick customer a, a, a technical support and then I will sit in line and wait. And then after that, they will put me back into the end of the queue for uh, the building inquiry. Why? Um, it's a matter of cost, it's a matter of efficiencies, but their efficiencies, no, not our efficiencies. Therefore, it shows the misalignment between the customer and the service provider. So building an effective program, right, must enable an ongoing conversation, but real conversation with the customer, introducing multiple opportunities for collaboration, uh, timeliness of gathering and then using that information, and timeliness, it also refers to, and we're going to talk about it, we have very limited opportunity to actually engage the customer. We are looking at um, maybe a total of 12 hours uh, in multiple sessions to really be able to gather information. So this is not much. And then the program needs to cover multiple touch points with the uh, customer that is addressing marketing and sales and support and accounting and any other department. So the next thing is to understand what the customer wants. So this is the source and the foundation behind value creation. What is value? It's a very important concept in marketing. Everything the customer does is because it's worth it and therefore it's value. You need to review a handful of areas um, of uh, developing value and reducing cost. Um, we will see that throughout this hour and throughout the course. These areas will help us assess the value that we provide to the customer. Many of the most important breakthroughs come from understanding those dimensions of value that our competitors may ignore. So value attaches to a need. When we, faced, when we are faced with a need, when we define a new product, really, how much time do we spend with the customer, right? How many customers or segments, <coughs> sorry, of customers do we interact with? And is it enough, right? How well the new product can fit the customer's needs? And we said on average, teams take about 12 one-hour sessions, that is a total of 12 hours, to define a new product. So we're going to take a look at how to maximize the returns on those very limited, not that very limited amount of time. Here's another way of looking at it, understanding what the customer values. So what is customer value? The value of an offering for a particular person is the perception that they have of the difference between the benefits that they derive from it right, and the use of the offering under a certain situation. So value is something, again, it involves cost benefit and it involves our interpretation. What are benefits? Right? Expressing what the customer thinks or feel they get from the offering. 
Of course, no two customers will view the same way, but at the same time, we got to be able to understand what a benefit is. So a very common example to uh, refer to an organization that understands customers is Costco. Right? It's a great success story. You have uh, customers from all walks of life. But and when you ask customers, why? Why do you like Costco? They say quality product at low price or quality products at low price. But when you look at it on paper, a Costco is not your typical retailer, right? Some of the things that Costco does and how they conduct themselves may look counterintuitive to the traditional retailer. First of all, when you walk in, there's very little variety. There's very little product selection. Generally, it's one or two of each product. Regularly, retailers are offering us a variety, a full line of each type of product. On one hand, we like that variety. On the other hand, as a Costco customer, you walk in and you say, you know what? Costco has done the due diligence for me and they already picked up whatever best products there are out there. So it leaves me much less a uh, set of options, less choice. And at the same time, it saves me time. Also, there's that annual membership. Regular retailers, you just walk in and you can buy whatever you want. At Costco, you've got to be a member, right? So you've got to pay. And generally, we don't like paying for stuff. Costco also gives us that sense of bargain hunting. And as far as the look of the store, it looks like a warehouse. It feels like a warehouse. It doesn't have those fancy frills that we have in other retailers. And back to the bargain hunting, many products just disappear. I, we can learn it by understand, understanding the codes, the prices that they have. But generally, there is a danger that the next time you go to Costco, you will not see that product. Right? And apparently, they use it for their, their advantage, and we like it. So what Costco understands that other retailers don't, they understand what customers value. They guarantee to get quality products at the lowest price, and again, Quality is defined by the customer, and even if it's not the lowest price, there is that value element. Costco understand the customers are willing to accept some nuisances, many of which Costco's competitors never before dare to try as benefits. Right, so those trade-offs, right, the customers are willing to make their priorities with that. Costco found few the few benefits that customers value while delivering the minimum service levels we are willing to accept would be sufficient and it's because costco saves a lot of money on those lower level needs so they have more buying power to offer us lower prices so on paper we may not like the whole concept that costco introduces but in practice we like it and costco understands that so the number one new product success factor, what is it? Robert Cooper wrote a book uh, about new products and he characterized the most important success factor for the new product saying a unique, superior and differentiated product that offers superior value to the customer. Then a simple question comes to mind. Don't all companies do that, right? So. Why there's so many products that are less than excellent in the market? Right? The short answer, many companies are too product centric, right? And they do not understand what their customers really value and then what differentiation there is and why it's important. So let's take a look. Right? First of all, successful product offers unique, superior and differentiated product. Right, we must understand that. I found myself many times sitting down in job interviews, interviewing candidates, and I asked them a simple question. Why should I hire you? And they, they stumble. They, many people just stumble on this question, and they cannot give me one good reason beyond they really want the job, why they would make a difference better than other customers, better than other, customers, better than other candidates. So thinking like the customer. Right. First of all, we must develop core competency in understanding what the customer value, knowing what the customer needs, 
by gives us an opportunity to know what the results need to be and then meet their goals, right? It's not easy to think like a customer, right? We spend most of our time working to make our products more successful, right? The customer spends most of their time working to make their own product more successful, right? So again, the customer is not necessarily focused on me as their supplier, for example, the customer is focused on themselves. And that's why the customer is not going to spend a lot of time telling me what they want. Another question to ask why customers buy, right? And the compelling reason to act or that CRTA, clear problem or opportunity that can preempt or help a company or an individual to achieve critical goals and objectives. We got to understand what the customer needs. Right, so based on that, we got to be able to change our focus from product to value. And it's easier said than done, like everything else. To increase value, we got to change the mindset, right? From improving the features to improving the customer experience. And then those features are going to be driven by that and be much more appealing for the customer. So the customer role in a product-centered approach is passive, while in the experience or in the value approach, it's active. Again, customer involvement is going to be more central. Communication is going to be more people-centered as opposed to the product. The focus of the marketing is going to move from the features to the value. The sales are going to focus on the buying experience overall and not only the features. The source of, a val of the value is not only technical. The product design will be integrated right from the beginning. And we're going to talk about how marketing and research and development should do that together. The initiate, sorry, the indicator of product success is about loyalty and positive recommendation as opposed to fit for functionality. And the indicator of company success is share of mind and loyalty as opposed to marketing and sales only. So the book offers a 4i framework, and we're going to see how it's broken down by talking about four elements, uh, two elements that are really identifying the voice of the customer, which is investigation and interpretation, and then two elements that are about value creation. So taking that voice of the customer and making sense out of it, which is innovation and incorporation. And break it down to a little bit more granular steps that will reflect our flow. In investigation, we're going to have three steps. And we're going to spend most of these times on inter in investigation and interpretation. Plan the visit to the customer. And when we refer to the visit, it's an interview, but it could be a set of interviews, and it, and not, it may not be on the customer site, and it may not be in person at all. But we got to be able to plan the visit. Just like a project, it's a charter and objectives. And then organize it, looking more at the logistics. So who are we going to talk to and selection of customer and segments? And then, of course, build a discussion guide and plan the questions. And then identify the team for the interview. Then interviewing the customer, conducting it, capturing the information, and preparing for the next interview, if there is one. Once we get out of the interview, we are moving to the interpret stage, which is essentially consolidate the information, but doing it really well so we don't miss any nuance. Conducting a post-visit meeting that can be extensive, right, more than a day long. Create images and statements so truly reflect what the customer has told us. And then start looking at defining and documenting requirements. From here, the next steps are going to be marketing and engineering. They need to collaborate, right? Define the specifications as part of incorporating those needs and define the engineering specifications and incorporating those into designing the document. So here's the breakdown. Before we go in, there are a few common mistakes that we must understand because first, the first mistake is not going through this program altogether of voice of the customer and other mistakes involve 
the following, failure to identify all relevant customer groups. It means that we may get great information, but it's gonna be incomplete. Failure to clarify data collection goals and step, uh, and step up front. Uh, if we don't identify the goals and the steps that we're gonna take and articulate it to the customer, the customer is not gonna understand where we are going with it, and we're not gonna have a lot of time to actually recover from it. Another common mistake is using the wrong data collection method. So it's not about just uh, whether it's an interview or another way, it's who participates that, the who we are asking and in what format and how do we take the notes and how do we follow up? And another problem is failure to translate customer statements into critical to quality characteristics. Uh, we live in an era of so much data, but yet we still struggle in converting this data to information by analyzing and translating and extrapolating and looking into it. So we may see it on the right data, but it's not gonna translate to anything that is a decision support based. So a little bit of breakdown. Step one, investigate, right? Part of investigation is planning the visit. Customer contacts have to be completely and thoroughly uh, planned. The key reason that visits fail is lack of planning. Well, we could have said it for anything, right? But here specifically, we don't have a lot of time. The customer is not sure exactly what we want. The impact on customer visits on our product demands careful preparation to ensure maxim, maximum yield. Step two, organize the visit. Identify the right person to visit. Right? Identify from the selection of people that are available. Check the appropriate number and types of customers for interview. And then ask a few questions. Who are we going to interview? How many people are gonna be and then of each profile or segment? What venue we're gonna use? And what's the appropriate cross section of the market? And is it representative of our needs? Mapping out the customers. Here's a simple tool, right? Essentially identify a few questions and then put some examples there. Who, right? Profile or function of those that we're gonna interview. Eventually, we want to have names and titles over there, almost like in a race chart. And then, for example, we have engineering managers, and then how many of them, uh, the venue that we're going to do it, and then the cross section, right? Segments or group that are chosen. It may look trivial to have a table like that, but that's going to help us understand with the numbers, with the venue, and making sure, again, we are creating the context to really maximize the benefits. We are not going to have a lot of time there. We also need to use a few tools, like right? uh, sticky notes, it just helps us organizing notes, uh, and then of course, affinity diagrams and prioritization in order to be able to link um, segments or sections or things in order to better sort them out and then be able to address them by segment, by timing, by time. Uh, other tools involve uh, some variation of failure model and effect uh, a model and effect analysis, and, and then simple things like process mapping and customer panels, right? Just be able to conf confirm information and provide some content. Then we're going to interview the customer. Uh, it says here, when you interview the customer, you got to focus on the customer. And although it sounds trivial and it really shouldn't, we shouldn't spend any time on it, it's very important to reiterate that. First of all, we are face to face. Right? This is when all the planning and the logistics come in place. And the areas of focus, four areas. First of all, communication skills. Right? Remember, uh, what we say may not be heard the same way, may definitely not be understood the intended way. Uh, we really got to take 100% ownership of communication, making sure that what I say is understood um, and clear as much as possible, we'd focus on the individuals and the customer's needs. Facilitation skills, we gotta be able to control the time, the flow, the direction. And especially when we sit with customers, it's very easy for the conversation to veer sideways a little bit. Uh, Note-taking. Um, in many uh, facilitation uh, programs and workshops and guidelines, they always talk about the need to have a certain number of people involved 
um, specifically talking about a scribe, uh, somebody to take notes, talking about an observer, talking about a timekeeper. We usually don't have the luxury to have so many people. Uh, one way or another, we got to be able to identify these areas uh, and really get roles and responsibilities straight. The note taking is critical. The observation element is critical because sometimes it's not what's being said, it's the nuance, the pauses and the looks. So another set of eyes can definitely help. But again, the note taking is not only getting the essence, it's also getting quotes and relevant quotes. And then consider barriers. Um, when we talk about setting up the interview and talking about the venue, one disadvantage of uh, visiting the customer at their site is that they may get distracted over there and this is a big barrier. They may be called in and out, they may have all sorts of, we all know how it is even in training that people, when it's on site, people take the liberty to step out, go back to their desk and so on and so forth. So we got to recognize those barriers and address them. Focus, timekeeping, right? Uh, flow, uh, communications, and then that's of course part of the facilitation. Another thing to keep in mind is the line of questioning. Uh, there are different types of questions, primarily open-end and close-end, but there are also all sorts of in-between and all sorts of questions that will help us. Uh, so we got to keep that in mind. Open-end questions are generally probing questions. They may be the first or the second question that are introduced or part of introducing a topic. And then after that, we can move ahead, close questions, other probing questions, a visualizing, exploring, feeling, clarifying. Um, the planning for that interview has to be very careful. We got to have full engagement. Take the customer through the journey of asking them and then getting them to express their thoughts, articulate them, and then get us to understand it. Involving open and close and then a little bit of probing, uh, clarifying, right, and so on. Step four, right now we are moving to interpretation. So that's pretty much the interview. Uh, uh, of course, we can have a feel on whether the interview was uh, a success or a failure, but uh, what we do with the interview will uh, significantly determine if it's really a success or a failure. So what happens after the interview? Making sense of what the customer said. Right? Check the notes. Um, this section of uh, the process of after the interview and then processing the information, the meeting and everything, it's about organizing the information that we got into a clear representation of the customer problems, covering everything that came up. And then of course, being able to somehow prioritize. So the post-visit roadmap, right? This is when we start making sense. The first step, everyone has to consolidate that information. So we don't sit together after that in another follow-up meeting within our company. Every person who participated will consolidate the information. This is a form of a Delphi approach that will allow people to organize their thoughts and will allow people to uh, sort them out, understand, and now when we get together after the consolidation, we are going to do the PVM, the post-visit um, meeting. Now we're going to compare notes, and the first thing we're going to do, and we're going to be able to discuss the differences in the perceptions that we have and in the notes that we took. We distill the information into a shorter set of customer voices, right? And by the way, take into consideration, this is an extended meeting. Um, Sometimes could be a day or even a longer meeting than one day, uh, depending on how much information, how many people participated and, uh, and the differences that we had in the way that we saw that. Moving from here, our goal is to take that voice that we heard from the customer and then convert it uh, in process to in due course to customer requirements and then to engineering specifications. Right, so that's a little bit of fast forward. So let's go back. The next step, step six, breaking the voices into images and statements. Right, we use affinity diagrams, we use sticky notes, and simple tools that help us organize the thoughts and sort them out by whatever logic and whatever flow that we have. Right, when I say image, it means customer's message as a vivid mental picture that describes the problem, challenge, issue, or opportunity 
that the customer was referring. It could be a diagram, it could be an image, it could be some sort of a jot down of what's happening, but it had to be clear and consistent, and of course, reflective of the customer needs. We are finally getting to requirements. And um, these are, uh, again, they're beyond, they're, they're before even business requirements. This is really understanding what's going on. And expressing good requirements is one of the uh, uh, most important steps in a new product development. We can also say that bad requirements are key reason for product failures and in turn for project failures. Right? Most failures, large number of failures can be traced back to failing to capture requirements or capturing the wrong requirements. It's important the product team has common answer to the question, what is a requirement and what makes a good requirement? So let's talk about it for a second. We know what types of requirements we have, right? We are at the pre or at the very foundational stage of business requirements. I, this is what's going to drive the product. Business requirements relate to the business results that the customer wants to obtain, dealing mainly with the operational and economic benefits. Then it takes us to the solution requirements, and the solution requirements will include functional and non-functional. Functional requirements, what the product shall do or what the customer wants to do with that product. And again, non-functional requirements related to the quality the product shall have. So on the right, we can see there are all sorts of types of uh, non-functional requirements. Uh, it's, uh, it's still time now to, to focus on both functional and non-functional requirements. And many uh, individuals, many people in organizations are failing to understand the importance of non-functional requirements or the need to identify them early enough and non-functional requirements involve all sorts of attributes, if you like, or characteristics, the look, the feel, the usability, uh, maintainability, all sorts of other words that end with ELT, right? Uh, of course, political, legal, and stuff like that. When we look at requirements, we also must consider constraints. Constraints are restrictions, right? And these are things that limit our ability and our options right, to offer the solution. So marketing and engineering will need sooner than later to uh, collaborate, and that takes us to step eight. Right? Innovation is the ability to bring new value to the customer. Right? We are referring here to a more to a broader uh, sense of the word innovation. This is not only limited to technology. I, the ability to innovate comes from clearly understanding the customer requirements and then the ability of marketing and engineering to work together to address the customer's challenges. Otherwise, stuff is going to be lost in translation. Then from here, it takes us to the next steps. Right? We're going to update the marketing requirement document. Right? It is now time to communicate the requirements, those business requirements to the R&D organization to enable uh, truly the ability to create innovative solution. We will then brainstorm the solution for each requirement. Right? We have transformed the customer input into a set of requirements. We will discuss, discuss these requirements and then each requirement uh, may be spun off into several elements of the solution or even several solutions then we're going to express the solutions and this is the time not earlier this is the time to translate them into features right in order to design the product the engineers need to know what they need to design right at some point therefore the next step is to express the solution as a set of features establish specifications for each feature right this is going to be the last step we're going to have metrics that engineering uh, will design against right and then the manufacturing uh, the people who build the product will test against and then compare back to the identification of the needs for the market although not all specifications are tested or listed some of them may be purely internal so 
the marketing requirement, the market requirements document, the MRD, right? The main purpose of this document is to establish a common understanding between marketing and R&D. Right? Why? Because I need to know, we need to know the prioritized set of customer requirements. The outcome should be to enable our, our research and development organization to create customer value through innovative product. But unfortunately, quite often in many organizations, this document fails to serve its purpose, which is to communicate the prioritized requirements. It also often creates confusion and even all sorts of power struggles between engineering and marketing. The result, products may be late, product may be poorly executed, poorly designed, or even failed. There's one study that shows that three quarters of failed products, right, will fail due to deficient or missing market studies. It means they can be great products, but they don't answer to the customer needs. So those misunderstandings uh, are built into this product, right, and we must make sure we understand it. First of all, marketing, does not have the requirements. The customer has the requirements and marketing is just in charge of uh, leading the effort of translating and understanding those requirements. Also the word requirements. This document should include requirements and not a list of features generated by marketing. Right? Requirements and features are still not the same. These are often included for competitive reasons rather than allow the customer to better address their critical needs. And then we need to effectively, effectively communicate the customer requirements to the research and development team, right? And this may take more than one document. Right? This is a whole process, right? So here are a couple of recommendations for improvement to make sure that we really communicate those actual requirements in the right format. First of all, use the customer requirements process. Right, the customer requirements process, again, the current situation, we just we put an MRD together, but really it's about market description, and then CRD and PRD, right, customer and then product, and then it leads to product proposal. Step two, at this point, forget about feature. The market requirements document often includes features, right? But a list of features will definitely limit the ability of the research and development team to discover it's not a matter of richer solution only, it's a matter of broader, a, a solution that truly reflects the customer needs and even have some innovation. Having separate pieces in the process will keep the team focused on customer requirements in the early stages, as opposed to narrowing our direction, which may ultimately be the wrong one. Then one of the most painful things that we can talk about is prioritization, right? Make prioritization a priority, right? Prioritization is a problem at all levels. It's on a daily level, on individual level, on the team level, and then of course, in the organization. Uh, quite often when we deal with stakeholders, internal or external, uh, we tell them, okay, let's prioritize the, the, the requirements. And then people say, all requirements are high priority. And then I say, okay, are they coming in order? And say, no, they're all equally important, right? The whole thing of prioritization is a matter of, uh, first of all, accountability. Because if I'm delegating something and I'm giving it to my team to do, and I give it in a priority order, the accountability is on me because the lower priority items may not get done and it's on me because I implied that. However, if I tell the team that you have to do everything and it's all equally important, I essentially pass the buck to them. The other thing with prioritization, uh, if we want to expand on it a little bit, uh, prioritization is part of the context of portfolio management. And when people have a hard time articulating what portfolio management is, we can probably take two words capacity management and prioritization. Capacity management doesn't understand what we need to do and what we can do with our time and bandwidth. And prioritization is because we obviously don't have enough capacity. So now we need to rank items. 
more important things will be done, less important things are less likely to be done. So back here to making prioritization a priority, having a list of clearly articulated customer requirements, of course, minus, minus a list of features is a good start. Then, if this is not prioritized and associated with the target market segment, we can deem it as useless. Prioritizing the requirements can achieve two things. One, provide clarity to the team about trade-offs, if and when, when we build the product. And two, if the requirements are prioritized and associated with relevant market segment, it will help us identify business impact, especially when we need to do those trade-offs. And then the last step, which again, much easier said than done, make sure that there is collaboration between the engineering and the research and development team. Right? The MRD is no longer a single document, right? But a process right? that prioritizes and effectively communicates the customer requirements. It does not belong to marketing. It's developed in full collaboration with the research and development. From here, moving forward is quite intuitive. The high level process of the next major step, define the specification. This is step nine. Prioritize the innovation from the previous phase, prioritize the attributes of the product, and then prioritize the fit. Now it takes us to step 10, which is defining the engineering specification. Right? At this point, engineering, these are the people who design the product, will do the heavy lifting. Right. They will still collaborate with marketing to ensure that what they do truly represents the voice of the customer. We cannot veer sideways right now, incorporating into the new design documentation, and then monitor the problems. A couple of the uh, methods, then the tools that we're going to use, requirements, formulation, quality function deployment, documentation, control, advanced communication skills. And then more specifically, we can use a whole bunch of models, including room requirements management and rapid prototyping. And of course, I mean, we see here the business analysis skills coming in. So the main thing from features to engineering specifications, right? The challenge of the incorporate phase, which we're in right now, is to protect the integrity of the voice of the customer. So that great product that we are going to build is actually great also in the eyes of the customer. Protecting the voice of the customer, engineer, yes, owns the process, right? Engineering and marketing will collaborate. There will be formal meetings that will have to take place. And then, of course, quite significant follow-up, create formal documentation of the agreement, trade-offs, and key assumptions, and so on and so forth. We must be able to change our attitude toward assumptions and accept that assumptions are very important in the process. And finally, got to look at continuous improvement. So continuous improvement from a company perspective, understanding your customers, why right? this is the most important thing. It also requires that the organization implements the methods, processes, and tools that are needed to support this effort. We should do it gradually because we all know that we cannot introduce change in one, one session or one step. And then it's the best to lay a foundation and then set about marketing and making gradual but consistent improvements, continuous improvement. Individually, Embrace the need to understand the customer. It will always help us. This perspective will help us anywhere we go. Customer first is what we think, and everything is driven by that. Always continue to learn about better ways to understand customers and make a commitment to champion the customer regardless of what the current organization is about. And with that positive note, it brings us to the end. So we have a few minutes. I will just take a look if you have any questions. Uh, before you have an opportunity at any time to type questions, I would like to thank you for tolerating me <coughs> for the past almost hour. Uh, I would also put on the screen, uh, especially the book on the right, which is the upcoming book, Agile Business Analysis, which is written uh, co-authored with Kevin Aguano. 
And in the meantime, as I'm trying to kill time, I was wondering if there are any questions about the voice of the customer. I got to tell you, it's very awkward to sit in front of that screen here and hear that silence, but I see that no questions are coming. Hold on, am I scrolling here? Show the voice of the customer book again. This is the cover. And uh, when this course rolls in the fall of this year, um, the book is going to come with the course. Uh, again, I mean, uh, very visual and very uh, uh, articulated with a lot of diagrams that make the well make the process simplified. Obviously, going in and those steps that we've been talking about, um, getting marketing to. Uh, collaborate and it's not a matter of whose fault it is but getting marketing and 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 uh, research and development and then engineering to truly collaborate in most organizations these are silos um it's uh, oil and water right sometimes it's very hard uh, from a person personality perspective from focus perspective to to actually uh, uh, get them to collaborate right um these are just different types of uh, thinking so it's about the collaboration, it's about knowing our role, it's about who does the heavy lifting when, it's about not falling to the temptation of coming up with features and with too many things uh, too early on. I, I see a question here, when will the course be and how long? Uh, we will cover all the steps on the 4i, yes and yes. So first of all, it will cover all the steps in detail with exercises, with examples from the book. And the second thing, the, the course is due to be launched at some point in the fall. Uh, Prospect will have an executive breakfast for voice of the customer. Uh, it will also happen in the early fall. And uh, what else was in that question, Sylvie? Um, we'll cover all the steps. When will the course be? The course is probably going to be up to a couple of days. Uh, I think that in one day, should it will be too aggressive. So we are looking at having the course say uh, over two days, probably. Um, anything else, anything else? I see no other questions. So uh, please, uh, my name is Ori Shibi. I'm with Prosep Associ Associates. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, some of you know me already here. I see actually another question coming up. So you'll excuse me. Uh, when will the course be? Uh, thank you, Sylvie, for thanking me. Thank you, everyone, for thanking me. I wish you a good rest of the afternoon or rest of the day and a great summer, please reach out. You can find me on LinkedIn. There's only one of me with that kind of spelling, which makes it easy. Any type of questions uh, related to these topics or others will be welcome. At this point, I will wrap up and I will say thank you very much and thank you for having me for the past hour. Bye-bye.